The federal government is going to be bringing down a speech from the throne tomorrow, which is Wednesday, September 23rd. And uh, it's expected that renewable energy, wind and solar, will be a big part of that. And so I was curious about what role uh, solar is playing in the Alberta electrical system. So I've, uh, we're talking to uh, Ben Thibault, who's with the Alberta Solar Association. And welcome to the interview, Ben. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Mark. Now, I looked up the amount of generating capacity in Alberta, and it's uh, 16,333 megawatts, which is actually quite large. It's third biggest in Canada, and it's even bigger than BC with its huge uh, hydroelectric system. But it's dominated by fossil fuels, and renewables are only 8%, and I would imagine that solar is, uh, you know, maybe 1% or 2% at most of that. And yet, here we are, solar is now in, uh, in its lowest is, you know, with storage can be two cents a kilowatt hour or $20 a, a megawatt hour, which is astonishing. Clearly the cheapest form of electrical generation. So where are we at with solar in Alberta? Yeah, the current status is that we've seen a substantial amount of growth at the microgen level, which is that typical tied to a consumer often, but not necessarily rooftop. And that's increased dramatically over the last five years um, by, you know, over tenfold. So we're sitting at almost 80 megawatts of capacity of that type of solar at this point. And that's been some really dramatic exponential increases. We're seeing doubling rates of about 18 months um, uh, of microgen solar, which is super impressive but the story of the last six months has been the utility scale where up until about four or five months ago we had 15 megawatts operating in the province and that's jumped to over a hundred in a matter of, of just a, frankly a season um, with just four new projects that have come on that have brought us to around 106 megawatts and it uh, a large number under construction right now, which could bring us to seven, eight hundred, maybe even over a gigawatt, which is a thousand megawatts by um, the end of next year, based on what's under construction, as well as what is kind of in the most advanced stages of approval. So a huge uh, increase of the utility scale that has suddenly outstripping the rooftop and microgen in basically in one fell swoop. Now we've seen some of the public util or the private utilities, sorry, in, in Alberta talk about retiring their coal plants in the next year or two or three, and, and presumably they'll replace them with uh, maybe solar uh, or a combination solar and natural gas. Does the amount of natural gas, which I think is about 49% of all generating capacity, does that provide uh, base load, which allow should allow Alberta to bring on a lot of renewables? Yeah, so, uh, you know, natural gas really breaks down into a, a number of different types of technologies. So the, the classic um, example of baseload natural gas, frankly, is cogeneration, because it's supplying to the grid um, on a you know, basically a constant basis because it's tied to its primary purpose, which is the steam generation for the oil sands. Um, but then also within natural gas, you have combined cycle and simple cycle technologies. And the simple cycle is what ramps really quickly, um, but it tends to be less efficient and more expensive. Um, so within natural gas, you have a diversity of technology options that can be used to pair with, with renewables very well, frankly. Um, and we're, yeah, we're definitely expecting to see natural gas increase in the immediate term in coming years as we see coal continue to come off driven largely by carbon pricing at this time. So that and that'll end up with a system where you'll have you'll have um, some of that natural gas will actually generation will be coming from the old coal plants that will have converted over and those aren't really great at ramping whether you're running on coal or natural gas frankly um, but some of the newest um, types of gas generation are pretty good at that um, ramping and even some of the more efficient combined cycle can do that ramping um, better than the, the technologies of a decade ago so we will see ultimately a system that does pair better with renewables and frankly as renewables get added to the system, the economic incentives will be in place for generators to invest in sources that do pair better with renewables. And ultimately, that will mean less actual of the gas and probably more of the storage that can pair even better with renewables. Now, what's the potential here for, for solar? I mean, uh, the Notley government had set a goal of 30% uh, uh, renewables by 2030. 
which depending on who you talk to is either overly ambitious or not ambitious enough. But so given that, you know, the 2020s is going to be a fairly disruptive decade, especially because now uh, storage is becoming uh, economic. So where does that leave us with what is possible in uh, with solar in Alberta during, let's say, by 2030? So the really interesting situation with both solar and wind right now is that it's largely being driven by these corporate offtake agreements where we have companies that want a variety of things. They want renewable power for ESG purposes. They want emissions offsets for um, emissions um, pricing regimes, um, or they just want to hedge their future electricity costs against potential electricity price increases. And so there, we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of companies that are kind of in that situation that are interested in, um, you know, entering long-term contracts with renewables. And that's what's driving the increased development of renewables right now. So it's hard to put your finger on exactly where it's going to go because there's a lot of dynamics um, uh, that are underneath that. You know, what we see as a trajectory to get us to 30% by 2030 in terms of the amount of wind and solar contracts that we're seeing kind of entered at this time, it should be no problem to get to that 30% by 2030. Um, and that happens to be, you know, well below the, um, the amount where we would start to see difficulties in the system in terms of, you know, having negative price moments or, or, or zero dollar moments and needing to export larger than what we have export capacity to do with our wires. So there should be no problem getting there. But there is some natural limiters in our system because we have a relatively isolated system. Um, it's not tiny, but it's not huge. And so if you bring on a whole lot of renewables that are generating at the same time as solar tends to do, um, generate pretty similar, you know, the sun tends to rise and set pretty similarly across the province. And so if you start reducing the prices dramatically during the solar production times by bringing on a bunch of solar, you will kind of have a natural governor on the amount that kind of makes sense for these companies to be entering and with contracts. It's hard to put your finger on exactly where that happens without seeing empirical data. So we kind of need some of the stuff to come on and be able to see what that does to the pricing in the market. But um, the key kind of linchpin that could help to overcome that barrier is storage. So the technology advancing uh, of storage and the price declines of storage are kind of the key unknown variable at this time for whether that 30% becomes a very quick 50 or 60% by 2030, frankly. I am, I, I'm very bullish on renewables um, over the 2020s. So I see no difficulty in getting to our 30% by 2030, given what we're seeing in terms of those corporate offtake agreements at this time. It's just so active and dynamic um, in, over the last year or so. Well, Ben, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. And uh, we've only, of course, scratched the surface on solar in this interview. and in Alberta's uh, generating capacity. So um, we'll look forward to chatting with you in the future about the growth of solar in Alberta. That's great, it's an exciting time, so thanks for having me.